Welcome to Sweet Valley Diaries, the podcast where even the richest, douchiest, most eligible bachelor in town can find his soul. I mean, find true love. Book number 18, Head Over Heels. Can Bruce Patman really fall in love? So does that make me Miss America? Hi, welcome to Sweet Valley Diaries. I'm your host, Marissa Flaxbart, and with me today is CJ Hulk. Hi, welcome, CJ. Hi, thanks. It's so great to be here. I'm so happy to have you here. Um, so do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, I am a script coordinator working on General Hospital, and I'm a comedy writer, and I write lots of short plays and things, and this is, you know. Well, I'm very happy to have you aboard in our little, like, soap opera, uh, accidentally comic uh, journey here of, <laughs> Thank uh, you. of Sweet Valley High slash Sweet yeah. Valley Diaries. Um, have you ever read a Sweet Valley High novel before this one? I have not. This is actually my first Sweet Valley High novel. So exciting. And yeah. what a Sweet Valley High novel. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> I'm so desperate to just, like, jump right in to this one. But um, let's start by talking a little bit about the cover of the book for our listeners that, you know, don't have the benefit of having the book in front of them right now. Probably. Listeners, if you have the book uh, at home somewhere, like, pull it out and, like, look at it while you listen. Um, this is a great cover. Um, I want to check what edition this is because I'm curious. That looks like a first one to me. Uh, this... Seems to be a first edition, copyright 1985, um, for ages 12 and up, FYI. Yeah. Um, <laughs> 12 and up. We've got two teens embracing, I believe they are um, Bruce Patman and Regina Morrow. Yes. Um, Regina looks thrilled out of her mind. She's so happy. She's, like, the happiest anyone has ever been. She's just, like, clinging to this, like, mannequin of a man with this, like, happy, crazed <laughs> smile on her face. Yeah, mannequin, I think, is the right word. He makes me think of that line in Romeo and Julia about how he's made of wax. It's like, he looks like that. He looks like an Abercrombie and Fitch model with too much shirt. He's got a lot of hair. I feel like there's yeah. some mousse in that hair. He's yeah. got some feathered bangs. And, like, nicely gelled. She's also got a lot of hair that's kind of got a lot of volume, um, some spaghetti strap action. It looks like... They're both kind of casual, but she's a little bit more fancily dressed. That looks like a fancy purple dress of some sort. Regina looks a lot like Jennifer Connelly here, I feel yeah. like. Like a young Jennifer Connelly. I think Connelly. so. Yeah, that sounds right. So maybe um, James Matthews, who draws the images. Uh, I think this is my first name drop of James Matthews in the... Uh, is he the official Sweet Valley illustrator? He's like the portrait artist. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Back in my Sweet Valley Diaries blog only days, I used to write about him a lot because he was sort of a, a like a mythical figure. Is there like a Sweet Valley yearbook where he's drawn all the characters over time? Oh or? god, I hope so. Listeners, send me the Sweet Valley <laughs> High yearbook. I need it, please. If you have I just your would hands love on that. it, I would love to see how he determines the difference between like Elizabeth and Jessica, and like how are the twins so different? And yeah, and I really think that um, Bruce Patman in this cover looks exactly like a Ken doll that I had when I was a kid. <laughs> right. Like, yeah, exactly. He does. I mean, you didn't have the same Ken dolls as me, Probably but they kind not, of all look but the same. But, like, I think I only had one Ken doll and, like, a lot of secondhand Barbies. So, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. But I had a whole collection. I had a couple of them. I had more than once. Um, like, like Sparkle Beach Ken. <gasps> like I had was... Sparkle Beach Barbie with her special um, lifeguard thing that became a bracelet. Or it wasn't a lifeguard thing. It was some kind of a sparkly was... design. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I had that Lay one. or something? No? No. Okay. I had totally hair Barbie. Do you remember that one? <laughs> I don't think I had Totally Hair Barbie. <laughs> well, I'm a little bit older than you, so it might have okay. been before your That's time, fair. but Totally Hair Barbie had hair that was, like, down to her feet, Ooh. and you could, like, style it and, like, cut it. I think it was encouraging the hair cutting of Barbies. I mean, that sounds right. And she wore this, like, skin-tight, like, 70s mini dress with <laughs> long sleeves. It was really special. That sounds really special. Anyway, we could talk about Barbies all day. I have a lot to we say could. about Barbies, That's actually. Fair. I do, too. Uh <laughs> but yeah, this cover, getting back to this, um, the text head over heels at the bottom, um, bright yellowish mustardy <laughs> yeah. color. Um Yeah, I feel like that's that's like the full picture of yeah, little eighteen right. in the corner because yeah. it's book number eighteen. And it's like a pennant, so you feel like you're cheering for like book eighteen. You oh, want yeah. this to be a good book. And I am cheering for this book. Oh, I'm still cheering for it. <laughs> so we have in this story really like 
I was thinking about it. I think there are three main storylines, and they're braided together really pretty nicely. Yeah. Um, the big one, of course, is about the relationship that we just described on the cover. Yes. I think that's kind of the common thread through everything. It's everyone's reactions around this relationship. Right. So it we found out a little bit in the last book about uh, Regina and Bruce were talking to each other. Like, And Bruce mm. was described as being disarmed by Regina in a way that uh, he never had been by a girl before. Um, but we just get a quick glimpse of that. Yeah. That was essentially setting up this book. Totally. And here we have that again, but we also have everybody else's opinions on the matter. Mm-hmm. And um, everybody else is really skeptical. So let's put a pin in that. Okay. And then there's a second thread, which is what one of the things that opens up the book. So the very beginning of the book, we meet the Wakefields. Yes. Uh, Jessica and Elizabeth Wakefield. Yes. What do you think of them? I think I really like how they contrast each other so well. I think it really plays into that, like, we're twins, but we're super different yeah. trope in, like, a cute way. They both seem very energetic and very engaged in the things they're pursuing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this uh, book starts with them, and it starts in their house. Um, a lot of guests on the show don't get the benefit of even really, like, realizing that the Wakefields are the main characters in the series because they just, like, yeah. crop up later on. This- but this was, like... Here yeah, they, are. they frame them really well throughout this, and you really get a sense of, like, what their struggles are, and how Elizabeth's super engaged at school, and how Jessica's, you know, maybe slouching along a little, but kind well, of more popular. Speaking of slouching along, at the very beginning of this book, something stood out to me, which was that Jessica was still in bed at 8 a.m., yeah. and I was like, is it the weekend or something? Because don't they have to go to school? Yeah. Everybody was still home on a weekday at 8. Yeah. I, I actually went to my high school's... <laughs> Website because I was like, I am sure we started school before 8 a.m. Sure enough, 7 40 was when the oh, first wow. bell rang at my high school. We started school at 8, but I know there's been at a- 8 though. Yeah, at 8. So, I mean, I, w- I would roll out. We lived like 10 minutes from where I went to school, um, walking, so about five minutes by car and seven by traffic. But I mean, I would roll out of bed at 7 35 and get there on time. If I had been in bed at 7 50, there's no way. So, yeah. Does she get demerits for it? I mean, we never really see a consequence <laughs> of the action. No, and like the Wakefield parents are both still at home. Yeah. We get the classic, like the description of the house in this book with the yeah. like Spanish style kitchen and the split level ranch. And it's, yeah. it's like classic. Like, I, readers of the series will remember this description appearing again and again. I wondered a little bit about the description of the cars in the book. I don't know if this is for a later podcast, but, like, the cars are such a clear demarker of, like, class between yeah. all of them. I mean, someone has a Porsche. I think Bruce has a Porsche. Mm-hmm. Um, Elizabeth drives her, like, ratty little Fiat, and um, I think Lila, is that her name? Lila. Lila has a, has a Triumph. Triumph, Which yeah. I loved. I was like, I want a lime green Triumph. Like, where did that come from? Yeah, we know what kind of car, like, anybody who drives drives a car in this book, we know what yeah. kind of car it is. Like, make and model, and usually That's color. Fascinating. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, it is pretty interesting. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, enough about the Wakefields. Oh, no, not enough about the Wakefields. No, we didn't even talk about, about the Wakefields. Um, I'm trying to remember... Both if- girls have a thing. Yes. I loved that their room descriptions were so crisp. Yeah. Like, Elizabeth's is so clean, and then Jessica's. There was a line that I really loved. Oh, yeah. Her room had always been a sore point in the Wakefield household. <laughs> Jessica's room, which was sometimes referred to as the Hershey bar because she had insisted on painting her walls chocolate brown, was always a mess. She rarely bothered to pick her clothes up from the floor. You know, I was thinking reading this passage this time, now that I'm doing a real close read of these books, it's not my first time through. The books almost always tell us that people call the room the Hershey bar, but nobody ever refers to this room (laughs) as the Hershey bar. (laughs) I wonder if it's one of those things where she's trying to make it happen. It's like fetch, and it will never actually happen. It definitely is because even yeah. though even the chocolate brown walls, it's like was that ever a, like a thing that like a fashionable teenage girl would be like? I'm totally gonna have this. I don't know. I don't know either. But so Jessica's thing okay. is that she has a term paper right. to write. She's got the term paper to write, and she's stressed out about that. And it's doesn't... 15 pages. Oh. She only has a week to write it. That's ridiculous. She must have had more time to write it than a week. Like uh, she, yeah. She clearly put this off until the last I'm minute. I'm sure. I'm sure. Like, no teacher assigns a 15-page paper in a to, week, In junior. To juniors, yeah. Yeah. No. We had a junior research paper at my high school that was... 
I guess, 10 to 15 pages, but we had, like, all year to write it. That was a long paper when you were in yeah. high school. Come oh, to think for of sure. It. Um, and then, of course, Elizabeth has yeah. a planning committee for the school carnival that they're putting on, which yes. is, like, a joint fundraiser for Fowler Memorial Hospital. Yeah. Which becomes this big, like, pissing contest between all the rich families in town. <laughs> I kind of loved that. I love them being like, why didn't they ask us to volunteer? Just- yeah. Because for, like... They don't even mention the fact that the hospital that they're raising money for yeah. at this event is called Fowler Memorial Hospital, named right. after the Fowler family. Right. But then the Fowlers are donating lumber, and, like, later on, the Patman family, like, Mrs. Patman, Marie Patman, yeah. finds out that the Fowlers are donating lumber, and she gets all pissy, like, I want to donate something. I did love that, how she came in and said they'd match all the donations, because there's you know, there's no limit to their generosity. And, right. Yeah. And then, uh, we're jumping the gun a little bit, but I might as well say, the Morrows, yeah. like, Mrs. Morrow is asked to be the parent advisor to yeah. the committee, and when uh, Marie Patman finds out about that, she gets all <laughs> jealous. Like, I thought I was going to be asked. Yeah. Um, I feel like Sweet Valley High never ends. I mean, this is the same high school drama playing out among these PTA <laughs> parents. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so that the planning of that carnival ends up being a big deal. And actually, it, for a lot of the book, it feels like Elizabeth is like, we're never going to be able to get this together in time. And honestly, at the start of the book, she says something like, it's only 10 days away. We have so much work to do. And it's like, <laughs> fuck, like, that's a lot of work to do in, in 10, 10 days. days. Like, you're planning a whole event. Yeah. Did you put off this the same way that Jessica put off the research paper? Like, Apparently so. Something's wrong there. But, of course, the most exciting thing is the Bruce and Regina relationship. And um, I don't know what your impression of Bruce was initially. Like, what did you think of him? Um, I couldn't help but read him. Maybe this is too dark for this podcast, but in kind of... Nothing's too dark for Sweet Valley (laughs) Diaries. But in the context of, like, everything that happened in kind of the last week politically, I was just like, oh, he's one of those guys. He's, like, kind of a jerk, and he's mean to everyone, maybe doesn't treat women that well. And so I'm like, what's Regina doing with this kind of scumbag? And yeah. But then the more I got to know Bruce along with Regina, I was like, oh, he's this sweet guy who's changed all of his ways and wants to give her, like, fancy jewelry and, like, tell her that he loves her. And... I was like, oh, maybe I'm being wooed a little bit by Bruce. I love it. So you were totally along for the roller coaster ride. (laughs) Oh, I was. Look. I was like, and when they had that miscommunication in the car where she, he didn't tell her about running for office, I was like, oh, can't you just talk to each other? You listeners who don't remember this book or didn't read it, you heard right. There is a running for office. So there is actually a political component of this. There's totally. I mean, we will a book for our time. Yes, a book for our time. So we will absolutely get back to that. Okay, good. Sorry, we're both so excited to talk. I just, I, there's too much about this book. I, uh, I'm head over heels for it. That's all I can say. <laughs> so, um, I highlighted a little passage uh, okay. that kind of sets Bruce up. So, okay. on the We're- off chance that there is anyone listening to this episode that hasn't listened to any other previous episodes, doesn't know Bruce from Adam, like, this is the way that the book sets up Bruce. Bruce was a senior at Sweet Valley High. Dark-haired, handsome, and powerfully built, he had a reputation as a ladies' man and a snob. Even his license plate number, one Bruce one, displayed his arrogance. Elizabeth didn't like Bruce Patman one bit. He had tried to take advantage of her after her motorcycle accident when she was suffering from memory loss and wasn't herself. And she knew Jessica didn't think much of him either. At one point, Jessica had fallen head over heels in love with him. Elizabeth had never seen her sister so affected by a boyfriend. The fact that things had ended badly, and that Bruce's behavior had caused the breakup, explained the stormy expression on her twin's face as they overtook the black Porsche. So yeah, Um, and I can vouch for this, Uh, Bruce totally tried to take advantage of Elizabeth (laughs) after her coma. It's horrible. (laughs) Yeah, it's terrible. Like, should we be forgiven? Like, should we let Bruce go and, like, continue dating these women, you know? Like, why don't they step in to protect Regina? I'm like, ugh. This is a failure of the sisterhood of Sweet Valley High in this book, and I, I hope that... They pull it together. In yes, but later editions. oh, I mean, I hate the like symbolism of what I'm about to say. But when we get a chance to see things from Bruce's perspective, we see that like he is actually crazy about Regina. Right. Um, I have noticed there's been a theme the past few books. Listeners, okay. maybe you've noticed as well. <laughs> Book number sixteen, Rags to Riches. Uh, a character named 
Roger Barrett, who incidentally is referred to as Roger Barrett Patman in this book. Right, because he's been adopted by their family, Mm -hmm. right, after... His he found out that his mom died, and he found out that his real father was a deceased uh, brother of Mr. Patman. So he's like a secret bastard cousin. I love it. Yeah, and he's how's that for a soap opera? He's a really nice guy. He's down to earth. I hear. Yeah. There's a weird moment where he like he and Olivia sit down, and he like caresses his girlfriend's hand (laughs) for like no reason. (laughs) It's just trying to establish. I do love those really strange moments of like overt physical affection that are referred to throughout this book. Like there's Elizabeth and Todd together, and she like caresses like the curve of his arm. I was like, (laughs) what's going on here, Elizabeth? Um, so, and, so he, you know, goes from having nothing to having everything. Okay. Book 17, we meet a character named Caroline Pierce, who is not referred to at all in this book, but she goes from being this, like, maligned gossip to being, like, a changed woman. She undergoes a transformation. And now here again is a transformation book where we have this guy, this total douchebag, who has been an infamous douchebag throughout the series thus Mm -hmm. far, now is having a change of heart where he's, like, becoming a different person. Yeah. But everybody else in Sweet Valley is highly skeptical of the whole deal. And I think they have every right to be from, I mean, what we know about it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Regina, meanwhile, like, what did you think of her? What was your impression of Regina? Um, I liked Regina. It seemed like she was just trying to figure stuff out. Yeah. Uh, She is so cool. Yeah. I'm constantly astonished by how cool she is. Yeah. I... I'm a little bit concerned about the portrayal of, like, deaf people in this book and the ableism kind of behind that. Oh, yeah. And how her entire arc is, is she going to get surgery to hear again with, like, what yeah. that kind of looks like? I don't know. She doesn't seem like she has any support except from the other guy who's had the surgery. I mean, there's no one else who right. is in the deaf community there. To, like, so let's work our way to that sure, part of the story. Of course, yeah. um, what you bring up about the ableism is... Yeah. is something that has come up several times on the podcast already. Sure. And I have to say that um, one of the things we've been talking about is how weird it is that the book always describes Regina's, like, perfect speech. Yeah. Uh, the books do. And I will say that I noticed something this time that I'd never noticed before that I, it makes me eat a little bit of crow, which is um, Regina had been almost completely deaf since birth. Years of training in a school in Connecticut had taught her to read lips so well that some people couldn't tell she couldn't hear them. Now, that's that we all knew. Mm-hmm. But this is the new part. And because Regina could distinguish tones, her voice hadn't been affected by her handicap. So there was some talk in a recent episode, uh, episode 16, bonus episode, I think, about how that was the reason why deaf speech tends to sound different from uh, hearing people's speech. Mm -hmm. It's because uh, a deaf person can't hear the variance in tone. So by the time they got to this book, the authors yeah. were like, oh, let's go ahead and explain this. We'll, yeah. We'll make, explain this away. It seems like they're definitely trying. Like, there are elements here where you can see that yeah. they're trying to be a little bit more educated about it. Maybe it's just the 80s. Maybe it's just mm-hmm. I, it something could be. about, yeah. But, but what you're still. getting at is something that I also alluded to a couple episodes ago. Like, the authors are so... or we'll say the publishers, yeah. are so dead set against making Regina's deafness a thing that they're going to eradicate it. Yeah, completely. It's going to just be gone from this doctor in Switzerland. Like, be- nothing Because happened. that's yeah. a big part of this book, is that um, she finds out that or her family tells her that there is this hospital in Switzerland where there's this great doctor who has um, only certain ki- cases will he have this effective uh, mm-hmm. hearing repair surgery that he can do. But um, her father sent all of this information to this doctor, and uh, it turns out that Regina seems like a great case, and he's going to take the case. Um, so Regina, we should say... I guess if it's not clear already, is like head over heels, hence the title, yes. in love with Bruce. She's crazy about Bruce. And Bruce, like, doesn't. Well, I was going to say he doesn't care about her handicap, but there is this one part. Um, um, is it the part where she's at dinner with his parents? Uh, no, but let's talk about that part real quick. Regina goes to dinner at Bruce's house. Yeah. There's an interesting look at the difference between, like, Regina's family is just as rich as the Patmans. Yeah. But they don't live in this extravagant yeah. way. They have the kind of more casual, more lived-in sort of home, the smaller table, and the Patmans have kind of the sterile, huge house with the giant table. And Yeah. Um, and Mrs. Patman is kind of trying, but, you know... 
over enunciating and being really kind she's of like offensive. Yelling. Yeah, yeah, to Regina about you know. And she's her like, yeah, she's definitely doing a sort of like diminutive, like, oh, your little friend. Yeah. Busy. And actually, this is one of the things that really endeared me to Bruce because, like, Regina goes to the bathroom. This is at the top of chapter four. And um, while Regina's away, he tells his mother, like, you don't have to treat her like a two-year-old, you know. Quote, she may not be able to hear, but there's nothing wrong with her mind. Anyway, she can read lips perfectly. And so, like, he really goes to bat for Regina and, like, tries to get his mother to, like, understand what's going on. Yeah. Which Um, doesn't work, but, you know, the fact that he's really trying and, like, standing up for her, I think, was was nice. Absolutely. And um, a little bit later... Bruce says to Regina, they're, like, out at Miller's Point. Oh. And (laughs) Bruce says to Regina, Try not to let my mother get to you. She means well, but she's got some pretty strange ideas. She really seemed to warm up after we started talking about my mother and the carnival committee, Regina pointed out, which is true. Like, Marie had had a total change of heart after she had, like, saw her in. Like, oh, you guys are doing carnival committee? Like, maybe I can do carnival committee. Like, what can I do? Like, she was getting gossip from Regina. Oh, for sure. Bruce shrugged. She's crazy if it took her more than a minute to warm up to you, he said huskily, running his hands over Regina's silky hair. Regina's breath caught in her throat. Bruce was the first boy who had touched her, and each time he held her, she felt almost dizzy with warmth. Regina lay back in Bruce's arms, looking down at the sun setting over the valley. It's so beautiful here, she murmured. She loved being alone with Bruce, away from everyone at home or at school, but her happiness was tinged with anxiety. There's still so much I don't know, Regina thought, closing her eyes as Bruce leaned over to kiss her. The feel of his lips on her throat made her sigh with happiness. I'm going to keep reading because this is also good. Sure. Suddenly, Bruce pulled her up to face him. I love you, Regina, he said softly, staring into her eyes. She stared back at him gravely and leaned forward to touch his lips with her fingers. How strange, how wonderfully strange to see those words shaping themselves on Bruce's lips. Um, And I want to go on because there's a part where he, like, passionately kisses her earlobe and is like... <laughs> um, I Oh, yeah, I've got it on. Yeah, go ahead. yeah, I wish I could bring your hearing back with a kiss, he said softly, looking into her eyes. You're so brave, Regina. If only there was something I could do so you could hear me tell you how much I love you. And then Regina says, I'm not brave. I'm happy. I have more now than I ever dreamed of having. For so many years, I went to special schools and special camps and special doctors, and it took me so long to adjust to the public school in Boston. Since I moved to Sweet Valley, I've been able to lead a normal life for the first time. And now there's you. And I the, I, I wanted to go ahead and continue there because that's Regina's mindset. Yeah. So then a few chapters later, we get a glance at her parents' mindset. Right. And there's this whole crazy story about the parents and the, her mother. Yeah. That's... Talk about trauma and, like, residual trauma through generations, like... Her mother was a model and then was pregnant with Regina and wanted to do one last photo shoot before giving birth and stepping back from her fantastic modeling career. She's already had a child at this point. So, oh, is um, Regina's brother older? Yeah. Oh, but whatever. We'll let that slide. She would. She had lost the baby weight. She was. That's maybe why she was ten pounds overweight. Oh, maybe. Interesting. So the modeling company or whatever the the magazine wanted her to lose. 10 pounds. Yeah, so she took diet pills. We are not informed what was in the diet pills, but probably amphetamines or something. But with no um, uncertainty, the book tells us that the diet pills damage the delicate tissues forming in her, like, fetus's ears, and that's why Regina's deaf. So it's as if, um, it's not just like the mom worries, Mrs. Morrow worries, Mm -hmm. that her diet pill thing caused her daughter's deafness. It's like she knows medically (laughs) that it's her fault, that her daughter's deaf. Which is horrifying, like, oh. And, and she has this residual thing of having these terrible headaches. Yeah, the headaches and the anxiety, anxiety attacks. Atta- yeah, that sounds awful. I mean, it sounds like she's clinically depressed, or she she has depressive yeah, episodes. I, yeah, completely. And, yeah, I wanted her to get so much help. I'm like, the town of Sweet Valley should really invest in some therapists. <laughs> <laughs> For real. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. yeah. 
Sweet Valley Therapist spinoff series. I often say on the podcast that there's no trauma in Sweet Valley, so maybe that's why there are no um, <laughs> therapists. But clearly, Mrs. Clearly Morrow... Clearly there is, though. She's so traumatized from this experience with the diet pills and giving birth and having her baby have something wrong. Yeah. Or, yeah. So, when Mr. Morrow has discovered this amazing cure and tells the family about it, Mm -hmm. the mom, Mrs. Morrow, is over the moon. Yeah. And initially, Nicholas and Regina, everybody's all really happy. But then suddenly Regina's like, wait, the details of this are that I have to go right now to Switzerland for a year? Yeah. And she flips out a little bit. Yeah. And I don't know about you, but I understood for sure. Like, I get having your hearing back is great, but I totally got why she was upset. Totally, yeah. I mean, it turns her life completely upside down. She wasn't consulted at all. It seems like everyone has their idea of what normal should be for her when she's just decided what normal is for her. Yes. And I think that dichotomy just, you know, obviously. This is where the term ableism really is significant because... It says, basically, assuming that Regina is going to be fixed, you know? Yeah, and that idea that this is fixing her, and that idea of, yeah, that's why I would be really interested, because I know there is such a huge debate over whether or not you give, like, deaf children ear implants or things like that, or if you should get them at a certain point, and if that's distancing people from community or, like, deaf culture and things like that, and so... Yeah, I don't know if that's totally what's going on here, but, like... And that actually even, believe it or not, even in this Sweet Valley High novel, kind of gets alluded to when this other dude comes to town. Yeah, Douglas, right? Yeah, what's his name? Is that his name? Essex? Something Essex. Uh, Donald? Maybe it's Donald? Donald Essex? Douglas Essex? (laughs) (laughs) Clearly he's stuck in our heads. His uh, name. I mean, he's tall, blonde, and attractive from, like, all boys are here, maybe? Yeah, I think he's got sandy blonde hair. Oh. Um, I want to know more about this Jack guy, but that's different. Oh, we'll talk about him. And oh, Even yeah. though I would love to save Donald for yeah. the boys section of the podcast, he's important to the story. So, totally, yeah. Uh, he, she meets him, he's, like, lying in a hammock. <laughs> and <laughs> Which I love. He starts signing to her, and she's just like, oh, this you guys brought a deaf guy over to talk to me, There's right? There's never any reference of her signing anything back or signing anything to anyone. No. So I'm kind of like... Does she know? Like, yeah. she just recognizes that it is sign language. <laughs> I And we don't even know what kind of sign language, because there are different, very, I mean... Oh, good point. It, yeah, it doesn't say that it's American. Mm. Are these American books, Canadian books? They're American, but, you know, maybe... they're Australia, New Zealand. England, yeah, and in, in England and in Canada, they were sold all yeah. over the English-speaking world, so maybe that's why they don't say maybe American that's, Yeah, language. they don't want to necessarily specify. Wait, though, but, but the books take place in America, so... so. Sh- it should be... Well, whatever, anyway. the authors probably don't know there's a difference, so... That's fair. Um, anyway... Yeah, he starts signing, and she's like, what's going on? And then he reveals he can hear, and he had the procedure done. He's like the miracle child of Dr. Friedrich, Yeah, uh, which is the guy's name. I do like that he doesn't try to pressure her. He right. just kind of exists near her for a few days yeah. and is like an older brother. I think she literally refers to him as like she saw him as an older brother already. I actually thought it was strange that Regina wasn't more angry with her family because yeah. they clearly brought him as in as a ringer to try to change oh, her mind. Oh, for sure. He's clearly a prop. And like that's frustrating too. Yeah. Like, so yeah. this is after she's had a fit. And, and her fit also has caused her mother to go into these like anxiety spells that she hides from Regina. Right. So Regina has no idea that her mom Ugh. is in, like, mental torture her entire... For yeah. all of Regina's entire life, her mother has yeah. been, like... I, I wanted them to have, like, a moment of catharsis together where they could be like, but I'm not ruined, Mom. Like, I'm me, and it's not your fault. Like, this is just who I am. And I wonder if that comes in a later book or comes... Uh, probably not, because she gets her hearing back, but... You know, it's occurring to me now yeah. that we are... Recording this episode on World Mental Health Day. Oh. Which is a, uh, the idea, my, as I understand it, is kind yeah. of to just normalize and shed light on the mental health problems that exist. Totally. Because of all of the damage that comes from 
um, a, a whole culture for centuries now of, of keeping that stuff under wraps. Yeah. And that's exactly what Mrs. Morrow is doing. Oh, she completely. hides her spells from everybody, including Regina. Well, there's such a culture of secrecy in this town and of status. And I think, I wonder if she feel, uh, especially the way that she and um, Mrs. Patman, like, go back and forth about, like, volunteering at the carnival or doing all the stuff or holding a certain social level in the town. I wonder if she feels that revealing her anxiety spells would somehow undercut that or, you know, affect her daughter socially and her family socially as well. Probably. Yeah. Although I, I get the sense that the biggest driving factor is that she doesn't want to further, like, put the burden of, of her anxiety on Regina, which is, frankly, an understandable yeah, standpoint. Yeah, I think definitely. But she needs to find some other... She can't just keep it forever. She needs a damn therapist. She needs a therapist. Because She's a therapist. She needs a psychiatrist. She probably needs to have some MRIs and, like, get those, like, headaches blue checked blue circles under her eyes. She needs... She needs... Yeah. Um, to, like, come up with a way to, like, let go of her guilt. Yeah. Because Regina is yes. fucking awesome. Regina's amazing. Regina's, like, killing it. Like, she's doing great. Love Regina. We so, never see her do any school work. We only see, we only hear about this term paper. Like, do they have any other work at school? <laughs> well, let's get back to the term <laughs> Okay, <paper>. right. <laughs> That's an excellent segue, CJ, because, so Jessica is bitching about this term paper. Right. Meanwhile, what's it even about? Do we even know? It's history. (laughs) That's all we know. It's about history. Because Lila's like, oh, what could be more boring than history? Um, So Lila has to write it, too. She's also bitching about it. And Lila is very much, like, over Regina Morrow. Yeah. Um, In fact, I will go back to my text once more. (laughs) <laughs> like, she says these really catty things about Regina. I can't imagine anyone staying interested in Regina for even that long, like, for even a week. <laughs> She's sure that Regina and Bruce are going to break up right? Um, pretty quickly. And she says that, and it says, Jessica laughed. She knew there was no love lost between Lila and Regina. Lila Fowler had been the richest girl in school until Regina moved in. That in itself would have been enough to irritate Lila, who had always made a point of having the biggest or newest or best of everything. But Regina's beauty and all the attention she got after her picture appeared on the cover of Ingenue was more than Lila could bear. Lila even goes on to say, just look at her. She looks ridiculous in that purple dress. You'd think she was colorblind, not deaf the way she dresses. Can you believe it? What a burn. I love that. Such a catty thing to say. That's so great. I mean, I kind of love Lila. Like, she's (laughs) terrible. She's, and yet completely great. It's like, oh. You'd think she was colorblind, not deaf, the way she dresses. What a bitch. And then, and then Jessica's like, that dress isn't so bad. She's not like, oh, Lila, come on. Yeah, now. exactly. She's, She's just, like, I don't like the dress. Fine. You're just jealous. Also, You're just a Bruce jealous is a jerk. Tag. Yeah, and the next part is she, like, reiterates how much Bruce is awful. And, like, Bruce looks ridiculous. Like, and and Jessica is really she's like kind of jealous. I think she's yeah. jealous of she's not jealous of Regina as a person, but the idea that Bruce could find happiness with someone when he was always so like flippant with her. Yeah, like they were supposedly in this hot and heavy relationship in like back in book three, mm. but Bruce always blew her off mm. and like kind of made a fool of her in a big way, and so. Um, so she I, can't handle it. Yeah, I am torn. I'm like, man, if he treated Jessica so badly, like, Regina can do so much better. Like, I know that he really loves her, and, like, he let her go with the letter and stuff, spoilers, but, like, oh, I don't know, hearing the way he treated Jessica, I'm just like, how do people change, and can they change, and can, <laughs> what do we have to do to accept that? It like, is, oh, oh my god. Yeah, I mean, big theme. You said but, a mouthful. Yeah. <laughs> but, um... Because of this cattiness, it, yeah. she says, like, I don't think they'll be still be together by the time of the carnival in a week. Mm-hmm. And Lila's like, oh, you want to bet? And they, she says that betting money is, like, gauche or something. It's vulgar. <laughs> she uses the word vulgar at least twice in this book, and I love it. <laughs> so betting money would be vulgar, so they bet term papers. That's yeah. Lila's idea. That just seems like a violation of every honor code. Do they have an honor code? Like, what's... <laughs> In Sweet Valley High? I don't <laughs> think so. <laughs> Maybe they could use one. Oh, man. That would uh, change the series dramatically. Uh, Jessica the, would be unable to function, I think. Just like the high school perfectionist in me is just like, oh, 
you can't do that. Uh, <laughs> What's happened to your term papers? And like, I think we're getting a glimpse into of, uh, <laughs> your answer to a future question. Um, right. So th- they agree to do that, and of course, right. listeners to this show or readers of the series will know Jessica takes this bet seriously. She does not want to write two term papers. Yeah. She doesn't want to write one term paper. Right. So um, she's going to go to work uh, breaking up Regina and Bruce. Yeah. Um, And her scheme is so weird. So let's talk about the carnival committee. (laughs) I mean... Um, Winston, I think, is my favorite. (laughs) I love that Winston just, like, pops in and out and, like, is just, like, having a blast. Yeah. The carnival committee thing is kind of, like a like l- like running gag in this book but yeah. it's like it's always a little bit of levity whenever it totally, comes up totally but it takes up a lot of space in the yeah, book yeah and we've got Mr. Collins and like his potential relationship yes. with the hot uh, French teacher whose name I forget that's right Mr. Collins is back and so we can have Collins, Collins watch, watch 2018. 2018 back again Mr. Collins has been missing for several Wait, books what? He, he just he, sorry I realize the Sweet Valley High I don't mean like he was <laughs> literally missing oh. he just hasn't appeared <laughs> after being in every book I know so opera, so opera. I just totally assumed he'd been kidnapped and it's now back. It's a safe assumption. That's my mistake. My mistake. That's fine. But no, he hasn't been written about in several okay. books, even though he was in every book for forever. Weird. And now he's back. He's guiding the yeah. carnival committee, and he seems to be having a relationship with Mrs. Dalton, or mm-hmm. Dalton, the French teacher. Listeners, if you didn't listen to the special, like, mid-season bonus episode about the summer special edition, there's a whole lot of Mr. Collins and Mrs. Dalton, Miss Dalton, sorry, and her, Miss Dalton's whole weird backstory in that, in that episode. Now I'm curious. <laughs> oh, you should read it. It's like okay. a really special book. <laughs> it's literally a special book. It's yes. called S- special. special. Yeah. Um, so... Uh, yeah, so there's all of that, but, like, there are different members of the committee, and one mm-hmm. member of the committee is Winston. Right. Uh, I think Olivia is on the committee. Yeah, Elizabeth and Todd, which leads to some drama when Todd thinks that Elizabeth was, like, flirting with some other boy. Yeah. And then, um, who else is on it? Well, um, Ken Matthews is on oh, it. Oh, of course, Ken Matthews. How so, could I forget Ken Matthews? Ken Matthews is running for the, like, Centennial Class Presidency. Something like that. Which the book does not bother to explain to us what that means. <laughs> well, why would it have to explain it? It's obviously the Centennial <laughs> Class Presidency. And he's running on a pose, which is right. great. Um, but And that's really all we him, need to say. Not great for democracy. <laughs> no, no. But, I mean, speaking of what's right. great for democracy, suddenly, in the 11th hour, Bruce Patman enters his name into the contest. And as bizarre as it is, Jessica decides that that's going to be her leverage. And she goes to... Well, I was going to say she goes to Regina's house. But before she goes to Regina's house, another important moment happens. To, I don't know if you marked this part. I, let's see. Um, so, is all of them at the beach? No, no. it's... About the phone call to the Marlowe oh, house. Yeah, she tries calling the house and just like, is Regina there? Oh no. I mean, uh can you let her know I called? And they have a whole moment about how And here. Yeah, the line uh, in page the- seventy five in chapter eight. She's like, Hello, is Regina there? Elizabeth shot her a look. Jessica's cheeks turned bright red. Oh, how thoughtless of me, Mrs. Morrow, she said quickly. Of course she can't. Elizabeth shook her head in disbelief. Only my twin, she thought, would ask to speak to a deaf girl on the phone. It just figures. And then she says later, and to think I worried about you putting your foot in your mouth. She's like, she's very <laughs> sardonic with Jessica in this book. I feel like Elizabeth and Lila could be great friends if they could just kind of get past themselves. That is a fascinating assertion. They're like super snarkiness. Like, both of them can be so snarky. Elizabeth they... only musters the ability to be snarky with Jessica in private, though. It's true. It, she it's... would never be publicly snarky. It's true, yeah. Which, yeah. But... So... So Jessica then has to go in person to the Morrow house. Um, because Mrs. Morrow is, like, involved as the advisor on this committee, and because mm-hmm. Regina now has been in this magazine, Jessica is, like, going... She come, cooks up this scheme that she's going to help with the carnival, too, which Elizabeth likes, and... I'm surprised that Elizabeth didn't chafe against that. I feel like if my twin was suddenly like, oh, I'm going to help with this, and she had a track record of, like, not working on term papers to the last minute and having a super messy room, I'd be like, er... Maybe. Elizabeth's 
ability to have faith in Jessica's, you know, turning the other cheek and, like, changing into a good person. It's just, like, her downfall time after time. It's, like, a linchpin of the series. Okay. So, Jessica's idea is that Mrs. Morrow and Regina are going to do this mother-daughter fashion show. Because they're both models. And Regina doesn't think her mom's going to be down for it because she knows that her mom has this weird energy around modeling. But her mom agrees. And all that... Jessica has in mind with this whole idea is that she's going to get a few minutes, like an excuse to have a few minutes alone with Regina. (laughs) It's so complex. Jessica could just like try and be her friend. They could do anything. Yeah. And she basically just does this, this amazing tactic of Jessica's, which is to be like, Oh my gosh, yeah, I don't believe what people are saying. And then I kind of loved that. I was like, that's so evil. She forces Regina to ask her to tell her, like, against yeah. her will to explain what she was talking she's like about. dragging this out of her. She says yeah. over and over again, like, she'll get, like, a few words out, and she's like, I, you know what, this is stupid. It's so dumb. People will say anything. I'm not going to tell you. So just to downplay it to the max. Right. And finally, she says that the rumor that's going around is that Bruce is only dating Regina so that people will think he's a changed man so that they will vote for him for centennial president. <laughs> Which is so fucking stupid that I can't but talk also, about it without laughing. like, I would believe that. Look, <laughs> I mean, Bruce is known to be terrible to everyone the whole first part of the book. Like, if I were Regina, that would be my deepest fear. But, like, why does Bruce want so bad to be the president of the... Centennial committee. I, well, oh, the college, centennial president. Yeah, college. No, college apps. Though he can get them, into. It. He's. I'm sure he's a legacy at oh, wherever. At like every college, I'm sure. But still, like <laughs> a legacy at every college. <laughs> <laughs> His hand just got kicked out of all of them. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> Technically. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So. Uh. So the the problem here, the reason why Regina is inclined to like this needles her. This idea is that Bruce hasn't told her about applying for this. Mm. So it seems like he's keeping his the whole election thing a secret from her, and why would he be doing that? Right. I mean, don't they tell each other everything? Aren't they madly in love? Isn't yeah. that what you do when you're madly in love? Well, and at first, I was so proud of Regina. I was like, she doesn't seem like she's falling for it at all. Yeah. But then we like get to the next chapter, and it's like, she was tossing and turning all night long, thinking about how maybe yeah. what Jessica said was right. Jessica walks away from the house like... No one's as good as breaking up a relationship as I am. Like, now we'll let them do the rest of the work. Which is, you know, just archly brilliant. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. You just have to plant those seeds and then scamper away, I guess. Yeah. So, then... I don't know. I'm kind of glad I didn't read these as, like, a young person because I feel like I would have learned so many horrible tactics that, you know... Well, and so then she and Bruce have this big fight... Yeah. That is so mind-blowing. Oh, they're just talking past each other. I just wanted to, like, shake them both and be like, no, it's okay. Yeah, she's like, tell me about the, like, why didn't you tell me about the election? And he's like, I don't want to talk about it. And she's like, I knew it, Jessica was right. I hate you. And he's like, what? I thought you were different from other girls. And she's like, I thought you were different from other guys. I thought you said you loved me. And she, like, throws all the jewelry he's given her in his face (laughs) and storms off. And Bruce is really broken up. But it's just like, nobody, he has no idea what even happened. Exactly. I'm surprised he didn't call Jessica to say, like, what did you tell her? Yeah. You know? Like, I feel like that would be the first step. Yeah, that would be a, first, a good first step Especially, in any breakup in Sweet Valley, is to call Jessica Wakefield and say, <laughs> what did you tell my other partner? Well, it just makes sense, too, because Jessica's his ex. Like, calling her and being like, or, did you say something? Like, I was yeah. happy. Yeah. And then... Uh, this spirals into, like, Regina is all upset and confesses to Elizabeth that she found out the secret about Bruce. And here's what I think is so interesting. Yeah. Elizabeth is always, like, the talk to. Oh, there's this hilarious line in this book that says, um, Elizabeth hated to interfere. And I, like, wrote a <laughs> note in my book, like, LOL, Elizabeth only interferes every book. It's the whole plot of every book. Um, but... She hears this shit about Bruce from Regina, and she is like, oh my god, that's terrible. I can't believe Bruce did that to you. Yeah. And here's where we can return to Collins Collins Watch 2018. 2018. She goes to talk to Mr. Collins somehow about what happened. I don't know why she's talking to Mr. Collins about it, but... And Mr. Collins says to her, you don't think much of Bruce Patman, do you? Elizabeth shook her head. I don't like the way he treats girls, she said. 
Mr. Collins sat on the edge of his desk, swinging his legs. Well, you're entitled to your opinion, he told her. And if I know you, Liz, it's an opinion based on good judgment. But you know, he added slowly, people do change. No one is all good or all bad. That only happens in old movies. Elizabeth shook her head. I'm sure you're right, she answered. But I get so angry when I think of the way Bruce treated Regina. Mr. Collins laughed. Ha ha ha. You're a good friend, that's why, he said. And I don't blame you for being angry. But you may not have all the facts yet, he warned her. Elizabeth's brow wrinkled. But Regina said, oh, fuck, I can't believe, this is really making me upset now. I know, right? <laughs> um, okay, well, ignore any cultural resonance to this, and we'll just think about what Mr. Collins is saying. Yeah. I know, because Mr. It- oh, God. I'm going to keep reading, okay. and then we'll talk, we'll try yeah, to talk read about it. it. I'll drink some wine. I know, Mr. Collins said, smiling, but I also know how easy it is for two people to have a misunderstanding. Like Todd and me, Elizabeth thought. Listeners will explain that in a second. Mm -hmm. All I'm saying, he added gently, is to try to keep an open mind. It's what you're known for around here, he teased. Elizabeth burst out laughing. I'll try my best, Mr. Collins, she promised. I just hope you'll keep an open mind while I show you the final plans for the carnival. What? I don't know. So that's that's what happened. She, like, gets sad and then she's just like, open mind, me? (laughs) Okay. (sighs) Here's what where we will glean from this. Mr. Collins is right yes. that getting the fact is important. Yes. Regina also didn't get the facts. Right. Regina is basing her decision on hearsay. So this yeah. is not the same as yeah. the political thing we're avoiding talking about Completely. Yeah, I think this is a different situation. And, like, you know, yeah, you want to... I don't know. Yeah, here they clearly are both misinformed, and they had a fight not knowing what the fight was about. Right. And Elizabeth is inclined to agree with the hearsay because of her bad impression of Bruce. Right. But and nobody is asking the questions to the people that know what's really going on. Exactly. Yeah. I'm surprised she didn't talk to Jessica about it. Did she ever talk to Jessica about it? She Elizabeth? never thinks that Jessica is to blame. That's true. It's weird. It, it, there's this moment where I felt a little American vandally because there's a moment where someone's like, oh yeah, Jessica was at the house and no one like clocks it at all. <laughs> <laughs> like, if anyone had noticed that Jessica had been at the house yes. and said something, that something she said pr- caused all of this, but well, no one has all the facts. But that actually ends up being the thing that unravels it all. Exactly. So yeah. So we alluded in that passage to Todd and Elizabeth having a misunderstanding. Right. That misunderstanding was that Todd and Elizabeth show up at the market house Mm -hmm. and this guy Donald Essex is there and is like hey baby you know (laughs) what did you say about the carnival the other day and um I guess the significance of that is that Donald Essex was hitting on Jessica yeah or or Jessica Jessica was flirting flirting with him him. yeah Jessica was flirting with Donald Essex both things are true yeah um the other day when she left the Morrow house we should have talked about that when we talked about the Morrow (laughs) thing we can circle back to the Morrows um so uh, when he doesn't know that Jessica has a twin, so when Elizabeth shows up at their house with Todd, and Donald is, like, alluding to the fact that she had been flirting with him, um, she is, like, playing dumb, and Donald is like, oh, I see, and, like, looks at Todd and, like, winks. Like, I get it. Not <laughs> like, winks at Todd, but, like, winks, winks to Elizabeth. Elizabeth. Like, yeah. I see, you don't want to talk. You sure, sure you don't remember. And Todd is all pissed off, and they are so stupid. I cannot <laughs> believe that they don't make the connection that, like, it was Jessica. But eventually, Elizabeth yes. figures it out that Jessica had gone there and talked to Donald Essex, right. and, like, oh, that's what that was about. Yeah. Dumb. Very dumb. dumb. Um, but oh my gosh. So there's been this misunderstanding. Right. And Regina broke up with Bruce. Jessica wins her bet. Mm-hmm. But Regina, now that she doesn't have Bruce holding her back in Sweet Valley, like she, Bruce is a big reason that she was staying behind. Right. Bruce and the fact that like she's finally felt at home yeah. in a place after all this turmoil and uh, yeah. moving around. Um. Regina agrees to go to Switzerland. Yeah. And Elizabeth knows about this. Mm-hmm. Because Mrs. Morrow asked her to keep it a secret. Like, she wanted her to convince Regina to go to Switzerland. Right, right. Yeah. And so Elizabeth realizes, 
Elizabeth goes to talk to Bruce after she talks to Mr. Collins and Mm -hmm. finds out what really happened, which was that Bruce wanted his winning the election to be a surprise for Regina. (laughs) Yes, he wasn't planning on campaigning. And also, he only... um, he only decided to do it because he wanted to finally give something back to the community. <laughs> oh my like god, Bruce! And so he was—he's shocked when he finds out about um, the reason that that was the reason Regina broke up with him. Yeah, and Elizabeth knows that if Regina, if he like goes to Regina and apologizes to her that Regina will probably not go to Switzerland and get her hearing fixed. Mm -hmm. So, what is Bruce going to do? Oh! Bruce, what? Elizabeth tells Bruce about Switzerland. Yeah. Uh, Elizabeth, just... It's both, like, maddening and, like, so important to this story working, (laughs) you know? Like... Well, yeah, it's... I don't know. It's so strange that, like, it winds up being that Regina's the only one left in the dark. Yeah. Well, yeah. She, and she she basically, she tells him because she knows that he's going to leave this conversation and rush to Regina and apologize and explain himself to her. Yeah. And she knows that that's going to result in Regina not going to Switzerland. And so right. she wants to, like, it's, it's a little bit like she's making the decision for Regina, but yeah. she's kind of, like, letting Bruce make the decision for Regina. Yeah. And she is doubtful that he's going to make the decision that ends up with Regina having hearing again. Yeah. She's like, he's going to want to clear his name, and that sucks, but um, whatever. Uh, so, then. Then he writes the sweetest letter. <laughs> Did you cry? No. <laughs> I, I, um, I definitely oh my god like just, shed some tears reading this letter because it's like, so br- it's brief but it's so romantic. Should we read so it? Much. We should. Also, I, I loved her reading the letter. Or it's just it's, like, Im- it's important to note that Bruce apologizes to Liz for being a dick to her. Yeah, I past. mean, I appreciated that. Yeah. Okay, I've got this letter. He actually, like, Elizabeth doesn't seek out Bruce. I I misspoke earlier. I realized Elizabeth doesn't seek out Bruce after talking to Mr. Collins. Yeah. Bruce comes to Elizabeth and is like... And he's crying and like, oh. Oh my gosh. There's there's a moment in the book. I never would have believed it in a million years, she thought. Bruce Patman is crying. And that's after uh, that's Pat. after Bruce comes to talk to her. Like, yeah. I know you're the kind of person that people come to for advice, and so I want it to. Like, that's basically what he said. Yeah. It was, it, so she's like, all right, I guess so, because of what Mr. Collins yeah, said. Yeah, I think so. I was very much on Elizabeth's side. I was like, wow, okay, he actually cares. Like, yeah. oof. Um, did you find the letter? I did find the letter. So, dear Regina... By the time you read this, it will be too late for you to change your mind about the treatments. And you mustn't change your mind, my dearest, not for anything. Elizabeth told me everything, and I must admit that at first all I could think of was rushing over to your house and putting things right again. I never cared about anything but you. I signed up to run the election last Thursday, exactly five days ago. I was wrong not to mention it to you at once, but I wanted to surprise you if I won. I can't believe you could ever imagine my using you. I love you with all my heart and always will. In fact, it's because I love you that I can't explain all this to you before Friday. If there's the slightest chance that you might be able to hear again one day after these treatments, you must go through with them. I'm not selfish enough to let you stay in Sweet Valley for my sake, Regina. But I'm too selfish to let you go thinking badly of me. You must know that I have loved you with all my heart from the first. And then... He, like, thinks to himself, he's like, it's not perfect, but it's how I feel. And I think that's, like, what broke me. I was like, Bruce. He, he, and he gives uh, the letter to Liz to, like, sneak into Regina's suitcase, which is a miracle that that works, but it does. I know, right? And then Regina, she, like, puts it in a scrapbook that she's taking yeah. with her. And she takes the scrapbook out. She gets on the airplane. It's such a visual, beautiful yeah. moment of her, like, she's like, should I look at all these pictures of my friends? And she's like, all right, maybe I will. And she opens the scrapbook, and she takes out the letter while she's on the plane to Switzerland, like, oh. it's taking off. And he put the ruby pendant that he gave her, <laughs> that she threw at threw him back. during the fight. Oh, it's so beautiful. I did love that her, like, throwing all the jewelry back was a very, like, Adelaide and Guys and Dolls moment. I'm yeah. like, yeah, take back this necklace. Take yeah. back this bracelet. Well, and then wrap-up of the carnival storyline is that they're all talking about whether or not they voted in the 
<laughs> election for president, which it's I thought real. was interesting since the voting is coming up here. Yeah, everyone vote, please. And it's like everybody said that they like to vote toward the end of the day because <laughs> they like to have all day to think about it. <laughs> well, everyone is obsessed with having all the facts, which is not necessarily a bad thing, but like having the vote pushed back, now everyone's voting for Bruce. Well, and poor Ken Matthews is yeah. really upset throughout the second half of this book that Bruce has thrown his hat into the ring, partly because Bruce has so much money that like, oh, he's going to have campaign posters and shit. Like, right. I don't have that. No, and then Ken just wanted to serve his community. <laughs> all of Ken's friends are like, you know what? Bruce did a noble thing. I'm going to vote for Bruce. And Bruce wins. And it's like, yay! Bruce Patman finally gets something. Finally gets something. He's got a Porsche with the license plate got, one Bruce one. He's got everything. He's got everything. And what does Ken have? Does Ken become like a serial killer later? No, I feel he's like this fine. Would... He starts dating a weird girl later. He <laughs> plays a lot of football. I, don't I just know. feel like this would flip Ken to the dark side. Like, man, if you can't run for <laughs> office, honestly, and not be defeated last moment by Bruce Patman. This is like a Hamilton Burr situation, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Now there's a musical yet yeah. to be written. I think this is as good a time as any to get to the part of the podcast where we talk about boys. Let's talk about boys. Oh, oh, oh who's a beautiful boy? Who's a beautiful boy? I'm in danger of losing my head. So we've already talked Donald Essex. Yes. We've already talked about Mr. Collins like, and Mrs. Dalton. Yeah. How old are they supposed to be? I don't know. They're like hip, youngish, like 30, okay. 20 okay. something, 30. Okay. Uh, because Mr. Collins has a son who's, like, five-ish, five or six, so, but he's, I don't know if, I don't know what's up, if he's divorced or, like, a widower, I don't remember, sorry, listeners, if you remember, write in, uh, and tell me, tell me what's up, or, like, send me a tweet. Yeah. At Sweet Valley on Twitter. Um, but, there is a sexy boy that we have not talked about. Oh, yes. Oh, Yes. Um, and we don't even know his last name. No, but we know his first name, and it's (laughs) a sexy first name. (laughs) This is Jack of the construction site outside of Lila's father's building, the Fowler building. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Jack is great. I was like, yeah, where's Jack in this book? And then nothing's resolved with Jack. I was like, wait, I have to read more books to know what happens between them. Yeah. So the whole Jack setup is actually, uh, it is a setup for the next book. But we did get some good doses of Jack in uh, this book. Um, In chapter three is when Lila first sees him. Um, I I loved their first interaction. It was great. (laughs) While she was thinking about the meeting with her father, Lila watched the construction workers struggling with sacks of concrete. Her gaze kept returning to one young man in particular. He looked different from the others. For one thing, he was much younger, not more than 18 or 19, Lila gasped. And he was handsome. His honey-brown, sun-lightened hair peeked out from under his war cap, and the muscles in his strong arms rippled as he lifted the heavy bags. <laughs> Seeing her watching him, the young man looked up at Lila and smiled. It was a cool, self-confident smile. Lila smiled back at him, slightly surprised at herself. She didn't even usually look at construction workers, let alone encourage them. I must be slipping, she thought. <laughs> I could keep her anyway. I, he just like saunders over. He's like, hi, my name's Jack. Yeah. She's, she's like, like oh. she's like, hello, my name is Lila. Lila Fowler. <laughs> yeah. And then he's like, oh, like the building. She's like, <laughs> and, later on, <laughs> and later on, when she's telling Jessica about this guy, Jessica's like, what's his last name? And she's like, I don't know his, but he knows mine. <laughs> like, it. you know, because her last name is really, like, important, obviously, yeah, in her status. I want to read some dissertations on, like, class in Sweet Valley, because, like, this whole interaction between them is so indicative of that. Like, yeah. Uh, uh, and um, <laughs> so Jack, later on in the book makes another appearance. Oh, he says to her in chapter 14, the last chapter of the book, Uh I used to go sailing off the south of France, he told her. (laughs) Lila's breath caught in her throat. That absolutely settled it as far as she was concerned. Whoever this Jack was, he wasn't really a construction worker. He was far too sophisticated, too (laughs) refined. I mean, I want to read the whole thing, but it's like I'm reading the whole book at this point. I mean, it's great. It's so um, ridiculous. It's... 
fabulous. I love that she starts second guessing the things that she says to him, which leads me to think that he's going to be dangerous in a later book because I feel like anytime I've ever dealt with a boy and like felt the way that she's feeling, it's gone poorly. Or she's like, oh, what a stupid thing to say. He's going to think that I'm too dumb to talk about anything but boats. I mean, pretty prescient, CJ. I think you might know a thing or two about this. Oh, no. So, uh... Oh, that worries me so much. (laughs) Don't worry about Lila. Lila can handle herself. Yeah, Lila's tough. Um, I I do really love her line early on where she says that um, he'd acted as if he and Lila were equals. (laughs) It's like, oof. Now there's one for your dissertation. Yeah. Oh, Lila. Uh, Just a couple other quick things about boys. Of course. (laughs) <laughs> There's a point where somebody asks Enid about her boyfriend, George, <laughs> and she says, he's at his junior flying class, a thousand <laughs> feet off the ground, as usual. I do love that. I like the idea that he's always a thousand feet off the ground, either physically or metaphorically, yeah. like he's always got his head in the clouds. Yeah, yeah. So George had a dream of getting a pilot's license. Do we uh, ever get a book about George, or is this like all we know about Oh, him? yeah. Put a pin in that, because we're going to find out about the flying Oh my gosh, more. I love that. And then there's a scene where Bruce shows up to the beach, and <laughs> um, he is described as tanned and muscular in an absurdly small bathing suit. <laughs> So. Why isn't that on the cover? I mean... <laughs> oh, yeah. He's wearing, like, a whole shirt, like you said. Buttoned up, like, mm-hmm. all the way. What? What is you that? You know what? Um, Malibu Beach Ken would never <laughs> have been wearing a shirt like that. Malibu Beach Ken would have a couple words to say to Bruce Pacton. Mm-hmm. Pat man. <laughs> <laughs> Pat man. A beautiful boy is a beautiful boy is a beautiful boy. So, CJ. Yes. Riddle me this. Do you think you're more of a Jessica or more of an Elizabeth? (laughs) I think I'm an Elizabeth. No. um, I think I... I think I'm a combination of the two. Am I allowed to say that? Or do I have to pick? Oh, yeah. You're allowed to say that. I think... Unfortunately, I am as messy as Jessica. I think that's that's true. But I think that I have Elizabeth's organization and, like, dogged determination towards, like, organizing that carnival or, yeah. like, putting something together. And also, I would never ask someone to write my term paper for me. Thank you. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> to wrap that up. Yeah. Lila has to write... Jessica's turn paper, and Jessica gets a D on her turn paper. She gets like a D minus and a C me note. And and Lila got a B minus on her own paper. Yeah. She's like, well, I was tired. (laughs) There really should have been, like, some more, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Some more conditions of that bet, I feel like. Yeah, definitely. You know, you shouldn't just, like, I wondered how that would resolve, and of course it resolves that way. There's no other way Jessica did not think this through. She she gets her just desserts, probably has to rewrite the term paper. Yeah, and she gets, like, a really stern talking to by her history teacher. Uh, Yeah. I just... Why would Lila be bad at history, though? Especially if it's, like, Sweet Valley history. Though I guess we never know if it is or not. Because she's so obsessed with, like, her family and, like, family knowledge and, like, the pedigree of her own, you know. Yeah. Jessica should have seen this coming, though, because while Jessica is all worried about the paper, like, even writing her own, Lila is so chill. And at one point, (laughs) Lila says to Jessica... Things get done if you don't panic, Jess. Worrying <laughs> about them is useless. And I, like, want to get that on a poster. Yeah, like, I want a t-shirt. Yeah. Because, I mean, I don't know if she's right, but I like that attitude. <laughs> Things get done if you don't panic. Oh, yeah. It's a very management attitude. Mm-hmm. Like, everyone else is, like, doing the work on the floor. And she's like, oh, whatever. You know, it'll happen. <laughs> so true. <laughs> CJ, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me. This was a delight. Um, well, it was great for me, too. <laughs> well, we'll talk a little bit more on next week's bonus episode. Um, but yeah, you know, I see nothing but blue skies ahead for Bruce and Regina. Yeah, I think that they're going to be together forever, XOXO. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so does Regina. Yeah. As she thinks about him and the, as the plane takes off, she's like, together forever, me and Bruce. Mm. And, um, listeners, if you read, uh, these books as a kid, uh, don't tell, don't tell (laughs) about what happens. I, can I predict what happens? Am I allowed to make predictions? 
We can do that on the bonus episode. Okay, sounds good. Listeners, uh, thank you so much for listening. Thank you again to CJ. And uh, thanks to Jocelyn for um, her song, Beautiful Boys. You can download it from all the places that one purchases and downloads music. She's got some new songs out. Jocelyn Schofield. Uh, check her out. She's awesome. Uh, send me an email, uh, sweetvalleydiaries at me.com. And please follow me on Instagram at Sweet Valley Diaries. Um, I'm also on Twitter at Sweet Valley. And the number one amazing thing you could do for me right now is to write a review for me on iTunes. Um, because, uh, you know, I just like it. <laughs> oh, and also it's supposed to be good for like people finding the podcast and stuff like that. So if you could do that for me, that would be awesome. And uh, for not just for me, but for us, like the entity that is the show Sweet Valley Diaries, which you are a part of as well. You, CJ, the person I'm looking at, and also you, the <laughs> microphone. Uh, I mean, the listeners. <laughs> <laughs> listeners as embodied by this microphone yes. process. Yes. Microphone is representative of listeners. <laughs> It's a, it's a totem. Yeah. For the collective effervescence of your listening crowd. You got it. You got it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Good night. <laughs>